the real FBI was the threat to the FBI. The FBI actually sends a friend in plural I gotta hit like 40 buttons. Yeah, true. Yeah. I gotta hit all these buttons and I did it up, but I didn't know the button. End of 21. It's like the scariest number. <laughs> By the way, you'll notice one thing about these conspiracies. A lot of them do connect. It's like all linkage to various things. Yeah. Yeah. Is that pretty amazing? Yeah, like eight sevens. You know yeah, so. Seven, eight, nine. You uh, record the. Um, what is it? Eight, eight, I'll record it right now. Yeah. The rest. Oh, so. yeah. Yep, I recorded them. Let me get my pencil. I'm not talking about the band. Okay, here we go. Okay. All right. So the conspiracy I did is the Agenda 21 conspiracy, and just for like a little bit of a, a taste of what we're getting into, it says, "What exactly is Agenda 21? It's little domination with a warm fuzzy ball." I thought that was I thought that was kind of funny. But um, so just for a bit of background, Agenda 21 is a non-binding document, and that's important. It was signed in 1992 by 178 nations, including with the U.S. and all those. And it's just basically a plan dealing with sustainability and the environment and all of that. Kind of stuff. And but the conspiracy happened like immediately after the document. A bunch of people just started talking on it. And um, basically, it's this belief that the UN is the enemy. They're trying to like take over the world with tyrannical socialist communist governments, <laughs> and um, that they're going to kill like ninety percent of the world's population with like viruses and war and things like that. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> Um, and for believers of the conspiracy. So we have Tom DeWeese, I think is how you say it, from the American Policy Center. He was actually like the first, one of the first people to hop on, to start the conspiracy, as well as Glenn Beck, who was like a radio show host. I think he makes a lead. And basically he wrote this book where it's like nature is God and it's in this whole like dystopian world where everything is like collapsed and whatnot and they worship squirrels. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, and then a lot of neo Nazis who also believe in the protocols of Zion. I don't know what that is yet. But um That was his thing that said Jews are gonna take over the world. And it was made up by the Tsars. Tsars secret police. People believe those churches. And then we have David Icke, who, if you remember, was from the uh, Reptoid Conspiracy. All connected. Yeah. And then, actually, some people on the left believe this, too. I believe they're called Democrats Against UN Agenda 21. So that was that's interesting. And then Republican National Committee and John Burr Society. So lots of people. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, side effects of the conspiracy. So politicians have been voted out for even mentioning that they support plans. And I forgot where it was at, but nine members of a planning commission quit in one of the states because people were like, it was this whole thing. <laughs> um, for Missoula, Montana, police were called to take care of an uproar at this, um, at this meeting. Because people were mad that they were they were like gonna have to pay dues to a plan or something. It was I didn't get much information on it, but it was basically a plan about uh, like um, vegetation and things like that in the school. Like, it was like this weird little plan that like was big for green space. Yeah. Obviously, that means big for war. Yeah. And then it's obviously made environmental discussions way harder because the second you mention like 
going greener. It's it just shut down almost immediately, so it's definitely not going to go. So it's proving the conspiracy. So it's actually it was kind of hard to find, but I did find the entire like 351-page document for the whole thing, <laughs> and I think that speaks for itself. Which I'll have the table of contents on the next time. Um, there was also a book written by Daniel Sitars, which just kind of like went over everything about it and kind of went into detail. Um, the Southern Poverty Law Center, where I actually got a lot of my information, they did a great job, I think, in my opinion. Um, I think just science events that have happened, just a lot of things disprove it, honestly. So. <laughs> So here's the table of contents. See, it's just stuff like protection of the atmosphere, combating deforestation, conservation, biological diversity. In my opinion, I think it's pretty great. So my opinions, I don't agree. <laughs> yeah, I just don't. Um, but I think, like a few other people have said, it definitely comes from like the mistrust of the government, because it was definitely kind of hard to find. Like I had to go all the way through an article, which is when I found it. I couldn't find it just googling it. So it was definitely a chore. But yeah, that's it. Good, and it ties into all these other things we talked about, doesn't it? One I think the most about the environment is the climate change. It's in almost exactly like a duck. I can't believe I used the word duck. Duck. <laughs> All right. Good job, Ben. Yeah, well done. That's a good one. And that it's all fit together. It, it, you can almost say it's the same thing about Harry, Agenda 21, as they call it, the Illuminati. I bet the same people believe that. I also believe that Obama wasn't born. <laughs> I mean, this is pretty amazing. And. I mean, so did you send it email or on Teams? Email. email. Okay, give me a sec. Backpacks. Come back, back. I'm actually going to get my backpacks. That was actually pretty cool. That was fun. Um, oh, no, I think we should bring backpacks. They're cool. Make cool moves. Well, right. 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 It's coming. You know, I'll trackers. <laughs> That's a good I have your bags and you bags and a why isn't there a horse with one on the case? What if you want one of those for your horse? You know, Alright, give me one armor? sec! What if you get a horse with one? Like a piece that puts your arms into your horse. Alright, here we go. Um, so, Don, this is I was basically talking about, like, um, that, um, the FBI has, like, files on them, which so this is the main guy. He fought in a 25-year battle with the FBI constantly talking to them, trying to get all the files, and they repeatedly told him that the files had been destroyed or never existed. And yeah, he wrote a few books on John Lennon, one about his music and one about um, potentially the government. Um, yeah, he told a lot of lies, exaggerated a lot of things. Um, so, um, the Beatles are kind of like the famous band ever, most famous band ever. So people know John Lennon, and people kind of worshipped him. And so anything that he made, um, people would basically follow that. And he performed his song "Give Peace a Chance" um, at the Johnson Johnson Clare Perry Molly. And then he didn't perform it because of the crazy, but he um, cause that was really a place to perform it. But um, he um, he like spoke out a. Um, like supporting that basically. Um, um, yeah, and then the Bedside for Peace, um, his wife Yoko Ono, he, he had just married his wife Yoko Ono, and after the wedding, he knew that um, 
they would like attract paparazzi and everything. And so he used that to like make a statement. So they stayed in Iran for I think two weeks. Um, and just let people take photographs of them. And then so Nixon, um, he was trying to like weigh his options because if he deported John Lennon, uh, there would obviously be like a lot of disapproval because it's like their precious beetle and just yeah, and then since it was the first election with 18 year voters, we really had to pay attention to that, had to make sure he was doing the right thing. Um, and then the thing with the deportation was um, he needed to deport him just to kind of bounce him all over. Um, but he had to like deport him to get out of the way, but also. Um, so the deportation was 1973. So and then again, oh, sorry. Right. sorry. He came to the US from Britain. And right. Tried, okay. Right. Sure. Yes. So then in 1973, him and his wife were both threatened with deportation. Um, and then again in 1974, um, the justification was narcotic type charges, and the, the, most of their basis was based on like disruption and like um, basically saying he supported terrorist groups and things like that. So that was basically all they were saying with that. It wasn't really viable. So then these are a few of the things he supported. Um, the program progressive labor party. Um, sorry. Um, it's still active now. It was formed in 1961. Milton um, Rosen, Milton Rosen um, created it in, a, in the 60s, and then Warner Richard took over when Milton Rosen died. Um, there was Workers and Alliance, where um, a lot of the work labor unions would team up with like students and start working. Um, base, like. Um, to like preserve labor unions kind of. And then something they were combating was the Revolutionary Youth Movement, which was basically opposing everything that the Labor Party used before. Um, and then Front Labor also like had other organizations inside of it, um, like the Cultural Community for the Social Community for Cuba and um, Students for Democratic Society. And then the People's Coalition for Peace and Justice. Um, it was an umbrella for several other um, things. They basically just organized it. It was all um, leftist views. It was anti-party, anti-war, and he also um, um, he also spoke out for that um, and donated a lot of money to the Harlem Defense Council, the Community Against Racism, and the um, National Coalition Against War, which is all part of this. And then the last one, um, which was the one that was actually the most controversial of them, was the White Panther Party. Um, which basically worked with um, every all people of color to um, uh, at first get civil rights and then expand on that more. Um, um, they supported a lot of punk artists um, and they visited the it was like it was a museum about racial art, um, the, the Detroit Artist Workshop, and then they always and he also um, used a lot of donations for them to support Woodstock, which which is the big festival. And then my opinion, um, really another one, it's basic, I mean, it's probably bound to happen because celebrities are very much like worshipped and anything they say kind of is taken as fact. Um, especially once they are dead, people kind of tend to um, think everything they say. Um, and then there are elements of truth. I'm sure the FBI did have a watch on him and we're trying to figure figure out ways to um, keep control of what he's done, especially because Richard Nixon made him so much. And, of course, John Wiener was very um, not the best guy to trust because he got a lot of things in life. So. Would he be allowed to stay? Hmm? Would he be allowed to stay in the U.S.? John Lennon? Yeah. Yes. Because Nancy got kicked from out of office, so yeah. He'd be allowed to stay. Yeah. I've never heard of the White Panther Party. How did how did the uh, Black Panthers react to the idea? White Panther organization. Do you know that? Uh, so, I didn't read very much of the Black Panther Party. All I know about it is you know, they're a really small group. Okay. And they basically trying to say that you know we're gonna be allied with them. So if they're actually you couldn't see them as allies. They were very small. Yes. And so they were not enemies. Yes. And yeah, there's a lot of groups and, and Lenny just toyed with them. I don't know how serious he was. Yeah. Lenny's an interesting guy. Who I really, really like. So people are about that. Okay. All right. Good job. Yeah, Lennon, I mean, the FBI went after him. They he was on his enemies list. This is, the big thing was anti-war, as you said. But don't forget that. The big thing was anti-war.
And Yoko Ono really kind of pushed him into these various groups. They tried all kinds of stuff, and, and the anti-war movement kind of got the publicity they wanted. So they wanted publicity? Oh, yeah. Lenin loved publicity. Well, it's kind of tough, you know. Once you get it, it becomes addictive. Yeah, that's probably true. Plus, I mean, being able to uh, influence so many oh, people yeah. easily is probably, I mean, I'm sure that's intoxicating, but it also, is. but the thing is, like, man, you're always on me, you know? Yeah, it's kind of funny. You know, and his best friend, Paul McCarty, hid in a, a barn and stopped. Yeah. He had enough of it and went there and made sheep. And Ringo. Oof. Ringo liked publicity. Ringo was pretty. It was a good time. We didn't even talk about Ringo. Ringo would have one of the most popular albums of the 1970s. Which one? Ringo. Oh, that's the name of it. <laughs> the name of it was Ringo. Shall we talk a little bit about the Flying Saucer Scare 47? I said we keep talking about Ringo. All right, well, let's talk. Actually, Ringo's a really interesting guy. He makes art. Uh, like, he paints. He's a painter. Is he still alive? No. Yeah. Oh, yeah, just had an album that was released. Really? Oh, it's the guy that wrote the record. Huh? It's the only yeah. Beatle people still listen to mm -hmm. music from, though, is probably Paul. Oh, yeah. Paul had a Paul spotted yeah. number one album just uh, three months ago. Yeah. Paul's 79. What a guy. Hmm? Love when he just my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, before we talk about UFOs, yeah. No, I'm guessing people of you guys like the people of Austin Times. All of you guys like the people of Austin People who have taste. I'm not like a huge Beatles fan, but you can't deny their impact. It's like Dallas. But no, when there's gangs, it's Yeah. My wife gives me a bad time a little. Or no painting of course. I have to. No, that's Alexander the Great from Pompeii. Pompeii. This is Bowling shirt. Can you wear the Bowling shirt on Monday? What are you talking about? The Bowling shirt you have. I'm not a circus. <laughs> I, didn't, I find it kind of funny that you went to people who have taste while also wearing the lovely wine. Yeah! <laughs> I didn't say what kind of taste and what. <laughs> Clearly not shirts. <laughs> Maybe you'd have taste in shirts if you wore them. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the wreck. Okay, this is going to be one of these most amazing events in history, and it starts right here in Oregon country, 1832. Okay, I made that part up. 1947. The Great UFO Scare. And this is going to lead to all these conspiracies. It's no coincidence that two months after that, all of a sudden, thing you know, there's people saying there's UFOs landing in Roswell. They all happen together. The great UFO scare. And you see this right there? That is the, the what the first UFO was before the term UFO was even used. I like that design way better than like the like modern UFO design. Well, where did that come from? We'll get to that. We're gonna learn so much about UFOs. By the way, when I was a youth growing up, there was a big UFO craze in when I was growing up, so it would be in the 1920s. And I used to have really bad dreams about flying saucers. <laughs> yeah. I had bad dreams about flying saucers and one that wasn't quite so funny, bad dreams about nuclear war. Were the, were the people in flying saucers, did you always see them as breed men? Well, they, they live in circle now, but that's another story. So what is the conspiracy? The conspiracy is that the government is hiding the fact that UFOs have been coming here. The existence of flying saucers, and they've been hiding this. So this fits in very well. We have Roswell. When Calvin said we had uh, his and talking about Area 51, who's doing it? Is it Agenda 21? Is it Illuminati? Is the anti-climate change people? Of course, it's the FBI. I would uh, I would also argue that involves German scientists. There's no coincidence here. By the way, remember I talked about making connections. Ah, 47 rockets. Be a coincidence, right? And the FBI wanted to kill Martin Luther King, or sorry, the CIA wanted to kill Martin Luther King because he was FBI. trying to leak this. Was it FBI? And so, the Air Force would even have a 10 year program called Operation Blue Book. By the way, isn't that plot kind of wild? Where they look into this, and there's even a couple of couple bad television shows, one from the 70s, and one relatively recently on one of the many networks that exist now. I don't know which one. Sure, why not? And 
Of course, they said that there, there weren't blind saucers, there were swap gaps. That became the famous joke. Okay, almost all the sightings could immediately been, uh, be explained away. There's a few that they weren't sure about, and they were clearly hiding some things. But the other story was swamp gas. As you can see from this picture right here. Okay, that's uh, one of the most famous fake UFO pictures. Wait, what, what was swamp gas? Yeah, what does that mean? Yeah. Swamp, the swampy ground, the, the, um, the very um, swampy ground. <laughs> Pay attention. Now think about all the things kind of slowly but surely kind of rotting away and releases methane gas, and that's it. That's swamp gas. So if you actually look over a swamp, especially on humid climate, you see that this fog over. Right. No, I get that. What is that? That's the swamp gas. <laughs> I think like it like obscures vision, so you're not so it's easier to spot you. Actually, what you see. So let's say there's a, a hill and a car going by. It goes through the swamp gas and goes up flying something. Okay. But it became the joke about them trying to hide. They would say, oh, there's no flying saucers. You just saw swamp gas. So that became the joke for the cover. Okay. Yeah. So the government is planting more swamps. Right. Yeah. Swamps. They have a swamp tree. Yeah. How come you didn't have conspiracy on the platform? That's true. What's that? Yeah, yeah, there is no conspiracy. Too soon. That's true. Yeah. Conspiracy on what? Platform. Like there is a Is it? Can we continue? By the way, nobody thought the world was flat until I think more people in modern times think it is than back in 1400. But here are a couple. This is an actual diagram, supposedly showing one of the things from a project blue book where you would fill out what you saw, then show in the sky what you saw. It. I just think it's great. <laughs> and this is one that people pop up on. Here's a flying cigar that shows that they made a project blue book or blue book. It's amazing what people believe garbage because this is obviously not true. But they basically said almost no instance of actual uh, um, actual UFOs, nothing from outer space, but we have proof. As you can see from these flying saucers and what's attacking them, this is U.S. anti-aircraft fire. So we have proof of flying saucers landing here. And this was filmed and shown in perhaps the greatest movie ever made. Plan 9 from outer space. You seen Plan 9? It's so, it, it tells the true story of alien invasion and, and the zombies from outer space. It's the worst movie ever made. It's so awful that it's wonderful. <laughs> So second semester, I like to start the year with um, 1950s horror movies, yes. which come directly from come directly from the Cold War. And we watch we'll watch a really good one like The Thing from Another World, fantastic movie from 1952. But maybe if you're nice to me or mean to me, depending on the, your point of view, we'll watch Plan Nine from Outer Space. It's amazing. It's so bad. So, there is a famous scene from Plan 9 from Outer Space. <laughs> wow, that's that out. That is so Acting. Okay, so here are the various uh, pictures of flying saucers from the various times. But you're going to see, you notice the different shapes. But they all start, all these so called flying saucers, from that. It kind of does, doesn't it? So, when is the first? There's a number of examples of so called flying saucers. So you see some uh, art from Renaissance art, which like look like flying saucers. Well, here's a supposed story that in 1884, in the relatively new state of Nebraska, a flying saucer crash landed. And if you look this up, you'll see this picture as proof. And we all know it's true because when they look like cowboys, so it must be 1884. And that's supposedly them looking at the bodies from this flying saucer. And in a museum in western Nebraska near Shadron, yes, Shadron, Nebraska, that diorama is there. Yes. The first camera is Lady Hebrews. And because you see pictures of Abraham Lincoln, yeah. And is this a real picture? Yes. 
Yes, of course, and that shows everything you need to know. Now, obviously, they put that in, and these are guys, in, and almost certainly not in Nebraska. But the first indication that, uh, so this came out, and this was reported, and as it turned out, it was probably just a fire. Another big one was supposedly an electric monster attacked two fishermen off the coast of New Jersey. And they said this monster came from either the sky or the water with huge tentacles and zapped them with electricity, and they were both found unconscious. And I agree with you. Boy, I would love to see that. But we still don't know exactly what that was, except it appears to be that they were drunk. <laughs> that was the story that I, as I understand it, but here we have a few indications of flying saucers. Maybe it didn't happen much before. Maybe they just weren't reported. And then in 1897, the great cow abduction of Kansas, where supposedly cows were being taken into space into a massive zeppelin that would then go into the sky and disappear. What is a zeppelin? It's a yeah. Not quite a blimp. Blimp. Okay, a blimp is like a big balloon, like a cigar-shaped balloon. A zeppelin has a steel frame, so you can go inside of it, and then they have these big bladders filled with hydrogen or helium. Yeah. And really well, if it's hydrogen. It's like blimp and so, for example, the Hindenburg was a zeppelin. Yeah. And supposedly, a zeppelin came down and was beaming up cows and then going into space. Now, you'll notice, whenever they have these kind of things, it's whatever the most amazing technology is, and the first zeppelins were just being invented, so wow, that'd be a zeppelin. How would we ever know the wonder technology of Zeppelins? Aliens. So the point is, there were some examples of this before 1947. Here's another one, supposedly in Aurora, Texas in 1897, same year. A UFO crash, supposedly there's a crash. There's a story in a newspaper from the 1960s. In the cemetery, they mentioned this burial ground. Once again, it appears like, Another one of these mysteries that probably is not really a UFO, but you get these little rumblings and stuff. At the same time, when we talked about Mars, you just had the um, canals on the Mars, on Mars just came out. And so, like, wow, Martians are coming. Martians are coming here. And maybe Venetians. Why Venetians? So, uh, or, I mean, a, a better telescopes are picking up on Venus that looked like it had water. There's no water in Venus, but they didn't know at the time. Yes. Um, when was the term UFO coined? UFO coined? You see, the first time being used in the 1960s. The military might have, Project Blue Book might have been in the 1950s, but not in mainstream, not in mainstream use. And then, of course, the famous Battle of LA. <laughs> Whoa, it? So, right after Pearl Harbor was attacked, there was a massive air raid on Los Angeles. And the thought was Japanese carriers arrived and were bombing Los Angeles. And they just, with almost no training, they, they had stuck anti-aircraft batteries and spotlights. So the year before had been the Blitz. You know what the Blitz is? Some of you should know. That's when Germany was just bombing all that, right? Yeah, and at night. Yeah. And the problem was at night, they didn't have the you know, radar was brand new. They couldn't put it on planes yet. And so the big thing that spotlights would do, you didn't know where to shoot the anti-aircraft guns, but if you get a spotlight on the plane, it, it, that's a, that, almost a death sentence, because it's really hard to maneuver at night because you can't see other planes. And so they started these uh, searchlights, but they didn't know what they were doing. These guys had no training. Basically, they, they just stuck National Guardsmen who had no idea what they're doing, and they gave them spotlights and guns. And all of a sudden, <laughs> there were these lights over the sky. It was a Japanese attack, and they started um, shooting up at the sky. Well, then it came up, no, there was no Japanese attack. They were fighting these strange lights that were moving faster than any light should. It could have been an alien attack. Or a meteor shot. Or just a bunch of guys who were scared out of their wits and started shooting at things. That could be a or rap Oh, yeah, because did they have did they have a uh, tracer rounds? Go ahead. Then, yeah, when did do you know what tracer rounds? World War One. Yeah, put a little bit of white phosphorus on them to ignite. 
You can't use it for planes, but you can use it for ground fire. You can't use it for planes because you fire, but then when you turn the plane, it's already too late. Oh, yeah. You move too far. Yeah. Now you're saying that they, uh, they shot over Los Angeles. Is anyone hit by a Yes, bullet? yes. A number of people would be injured by the. So these shells, the idea was they would explode in the air, put shrapnel off, and hopefully the plane would fly into it. And but they would just rain down on people. Oh, like at Pearl Harbor, almost all the civilian casualties from the Japanese attack were from US anti aircraft guns just blasting out in the air. Because Japanese did not target civilians. I'm not saying they wouldn't have in other places, but not at Pearl Harbor. They didn't. Um, so for tracer rounds, are that is that same technique still used today? Where you oh, just sure. put white phosphorus? Sure. So they haven't like found any like, better solutions for it. I mean, it's, no, it's, it's just a tiny little drop, so it burns away. Yeah, yeah. Obviously. What's that? The Japanese killing civilians at Pearl Harbor is a myth. They they attacked the naval base, and. Any, any, any civilians that were hit by the Japanese attack were hit by missiles. And don't get me wrong, the Japanese did the civilians in other places like China or you know, it was horrific, but not there. Yeah. Nowadays, with the technology, they just give you that vision. It doesn't stick without the bullets are so Yeah, you can see them, yeah. But they still use it. They still use the uh, tracers. And so with that, was there a raid? Yeah, actually, a Jap Japanese submarines have a little seaplane on them. They could actually go underwater and tie the seaplane to it, a little floor plane. And a Japanese sub did land. They released the floor plane. It did take off and buzz LA. And no one shot at it. They didn't even know it flew over. That's actually a true story. Here, they're firing at perhaps this beautiful mountain scene. As you can see, Foo Fighters. Fighters became another example of UFOs. This is one of the great mysteries. German planes saw this. We have large numbers of planes flying at relatively high altitude. And what happened was all of these little like balls of fire started dancing around the planes. And here is a picture where supposedly these are Foo Fighters. And they would bounce around the plane and fly around and do all these maneuvers around planes. And there's this book in um, kids book called the Foo Fighter, and so they call them Foo Fighters, like fighter planes. And they would sometimes shoot out, and for the most part, they were just this weird mystery. They would bounce around and fly and then go off, and nobody knows what they exactly were. Well, probably not, because they're about, they're 18,000 feet. Yeah, glow in the dark work. They could have been, and then of course, they could have been aliens, I'll just talk about that. Almost certainly there were some kind of electromagnetic reaction, something like ball lightning. But planes still see them today. I've seen one I'm bouncing on a on a wing of a of a 737 I was flying. Oof. Look a little bouncing plane. And then it came to life. No, okay, then so the point is there are these events that happen. The war ended, we got the Cold War. Oh, here is here is the silver balls, and uh, it says perhaps is a Nazi weapon. Nazi viewers support device. Because there is that belief, and I think Brady mentioned that, like, oh, the Nazis have all this technology, which turned out to be not true at all. You know, they ran almost all their scientists out. A few rocket, uh, a few rocket scientists, and because the U.S. didn't put any money in that, we we didn't put we didn't put our, our resources into jets. We put our resources into very good planes. We actually had very good planes. So there are also these mysteries called the Shaver Mysteries. And these were these little books. Look at the price for a novel back then, 35 cents. And that was actually relatively expensive. But it's just so weird seeing the price because there's been so much inflation. I mean, this is probably a uh, month. Let's see about, so about nine bucks. So, yeah, it's still relatively yeah, expensive. Like 10 bucks. And, and so they have these, and so these are stories, and this is from before World War II. They had these strange flying craft, and you notice what they look like. And these are really popular, the science spot, the sci fi. This was the time where the Buck Rogers cereal, you ever heard of Buck Rogers? They had these little cereals where they would play these little 10 minute movies, of either in the middle of, of um, motion pictures, that have a little short. 
they put like a Buck Rogers cereal with that, you know, one little 10 minute adventure, two weeks later be another 10 minute adventure. They do this in the middle of movies. That's also what cartoons would be. Like Bugs Bunny would be in the middle of a movie. Cereals were basically TV shows before TV yeah. shows. Mm-hmm. And Buck Rogers was huge. There'd be Superman cereals. So they have these kind of like, you know, a lot of science fiction stuff. And that's like serial serials is a term for the short film. A serial is a term for a story that will um continue. Yeah, will continue. Oh, okay. So like and, TV shows are either episodic or serialized. Serialized means there's a running through plot. Episodic means it's just contained in that one thing. So a serial is anything that's continued beyond itself. So like a series of books could be called serialized if they continue along. Okay. And that's they that's why they call them series. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that yeah, that's exactly right. And you see both of them like that. But yeah, it's a fuck Rogers is huge. Okay. By the way, talking to people who are alive like me during the 1940s, and those who come on during the theaters, and all the little kids start cheering and standing on their, their chairs when like a Bugs Bunny or Buck Rogers would come on. And I agree, Bugs Bunny are awesome. Yeah, Bugs Bunny is awesome. Bugs Bunny is awesome. Bugs Bunny is awesome. No one has the same enthusiasm towards Bugs Bunny. It is part of my childhood. So, in 1947, the great UFO wave hit. Of all the so-called flying saucers, you can see about 30 total, including Foo Fighters and all that, in the years of the 20th century before 47. Maybe 30 in summer. I don't think it turns out aliens, just these weird things. After Kenneth Arnold made his sighting and he just happened to hit the news on a slow news day, there are going to be hundreds in that year. Everywhere. And so much of what we say about UFOs would come out of that hysteria in 1947. And so here is one supposedly done for the Air Force about the UFO wave of 47. That was written in 1967. Interesting year. So here's Kenneth Arnold. And he looks like a darn good guy. But he had a little plane, single engine plane, and he was flying from... First, Chihalis is here to Yakima, Washington, by Mount Rainier. And here he had his little camera with him. Little camera, 35 millimeter camera. Didn't really have a zoom lens. But he's just flying near Mount Rainier. I think about Rain, Mount Rainier, snow covered, icy, uh, with the sun, it's going to leave a lot of reflections. And supposedly, what he saw by Mount Rainier, as he is flying by, he saw these objects fly by in a pattern like this. And they were reflected and they were dancing around, almost he said like they were being, like you skipping a stone, a stone on a lake. This kind of they were shimmering and bouncing around. Or another way he said it's almost like you're skipping a saucer on a lake. But they weren't saucers. So he reported this, and that is the picture he saw. So people have kind of embellished it to here, but this is a basic look, and they kind of added this to make it look a little more dramatic. But this kind of a shape like a flying wing. And, but did you catch that word I said? Skipping like a saucer, and that was in the newspaper. Like a flying saucer. That's not what he saw. But, saucers and it stuck they did not look like a saucer he said there was skipping like you skipped a saucer like a like a plate and also it got reported as flash gordon i just mentioned or flash gordon was another serial and flying saucer there's his personal drawing though And that's what we get. Get that from Plan 9, too. All of a sudden, people started seeing saucers all over the place. So the whole thing about flying saucers was just a reporter not being clear and people misreading it and getting all over the country for flying saucers. And that became part of the great scare. Yes, Tom? Is there a saw the sign saucer? Sure. Yeah. Especially through swamp gas. 
So with that, okay, I couldn't help that. Just a week later, off Murray Island, so in Washington, here is another one. Harold Dahl said that he was in a or going on a little pier to go out onto his boat, just stepped on his boat and was attacked by now round cylinders hollow inside, that saucer shape. He was attacked, beans came all over and attacked him. Here is his dog, obviously the dog's right here, his hide. And it came from all over. They dropped like metal pieces on him. And he wanted to go tell, supposedly tell what happened. And he was approached by a man in black. And the whole mythology about men in black who would come and hide what people saw would start right here and told them, keep your mouth shut. And that goes back to Jesus, right? Huh? And then they, well, you have this men in black, oh, they must be FBI agents or CIA agents or something more. By the way, yeah, G Man, that come from Treasury agents and trying to get bootleggers. And there was some kind of metal they found, and he found it. It was unlike any metal he has ever seen, but the man in black took it. So there's no evidence, just this story. But you know, it's just a week after. They must be real. And that is just the beginning. So we're just talking June. What a summer. So that is a very stylized picture of it. I love this one. Because they also included this wonderful valley scene. And kind of black. <laughs> so you can blame you can blame Maury or Harold Dahl for these movies and this is another one. This is from a movie about that, about a man in black. But yeah, we're not going to so. so now, as it turned out, there was an explanation: a B-25 Mitchell bomb. So this is a World War II era bomb, a twin engine. It crashed near that site. Near what site? Near where Harold Dahl saw this, and pieces were falling off. Almost certainly that was it. It was on fire, it crashed, things fell. Almost certainly. But doesn't this sound like a cover-up? Of course a B-25 crashed. To hide what they really saw. Now this all fits in. There's a lot of, this is a really cheesy movie, but I'm not going to flash this off. And what it came about is the whole series of ideas of these men in black hiding the truth. That's the men in black. Here's a book that would be incredibly popular in, um, in certain circles. So I can remember looking at my uncle's comic books. Mom played comic books. My uncle was born in, get my years right, 51. And they were comic books, I mean like, like Archie comic books. And he had this big stack of them. It's weird because I was in my 40s, but I was looking at these. And I remember that. And I remember that because it scared me. Because I was kind of scared of flying saucers. And I just, it, I can remember looking at it. And then I remember, you know, my uncle told me it's not real. And then he goes, well, let me tell you. Because, you know, he's an uncle. But, and so he scared me. You know what I saw? <laughs> okay, with that. And I wish I would have that comic book. I would love to still have that one. But they started pushing, pushing these books about Men and blood. What happened when certain researchers found out they were disappeared? Disappeared. But we're not done. Oh, here's more about the Murray Island incident. Let's jump right to this. Well, there's something else going on at this time. The United States Air Force was experimenting with new planes. The Germans experimented with a flying wing, and the United States made one called the B-49. It was going to be a bomber that would multi-engine. And there it is right there. Now, what's the advantage of a flying wing? Less on the radar. Okay, less radar, and what else? Yeah. It actually is, um, they thought it would be more aerodynamic, would have the extra weight. If you carry bombs easier, the thought was it could cruise at a very high altitude. Well, and I'm sure you curious now. And now, did it work? No. Well, the problem is that they can't maneuver. 
Ironically, one of our main bombers that we would never have to be using in real life is the B-2, which is a flying wing. It's called the stealth bomber. And the problem with it is it's not that stealth and it can't maneuver if someone sees it. But somebody made a lot of money off of them. And then my personal flavor, but by the way, has anyone seen many planes like this before? Wait, wait. Have you ever seen this plane? No. They literally called it the flying pancake. <laughs> and the thought was this would be more maneuverable. What does this look like? Would it get to Great Falls? I'll finish the rest of this on Monday. Have a good weekend. We'll see ya. Goodbye, everybody. We made it through another week. Good point. It's still Friday. I got replaced by the reptilians. Oh, reptilians are here. Good job. Two, two very good presentations today. Thank you very much. Aliens abound. I have a, I actually have this old book about uh, like worst planes have made, like all these different like, concept yeah. planes and stuff like that. Some of them are like UFO based, like the one where where uh, you, you try to get like these like soldiers to levitate off the ground so they can like shoot from a higher position. It's an idea. Oh, I believe it. Yeah. I mean, this one has nothing to do with actual flying talks with you. They thought, but it, it looked like one. Yeah. Uh, I have a bunch of old, uh, vinyls from the 60s and 70s and 80s that are just taking up room in my house. Do you want me to bring some of that in that I think you'd like? Go take a look at it. What the heck? Yeah, maybe, maybe just to hang out and look at it. Cool. Yeah, I'll make sure no one wants them. Yeah, no, no. I've, I've tried pawning these off on everyone imaginable. Yeah, sometimes you make them mandatory for your warehouse. I make it mandatory for Now, there might be a good chance I don't want them. That is fair. Oh, I saw. There are lots of polkas, and I know you're into polkas. So. Oh, 